Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Pekraski. I am a volunteer at the Mawa Museum. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's webinar, uh, which is Les Paul, The Early Years in Waukesha. Um, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes until we get more people in from the waiting room. Uh, so, but we're glad that you're with us tonight. Okay, it's 730. So I would like to hand uh, uh, things over to Charlie Carreras, who's the Vice President of the Mawa Museum. Charlie? Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> Welcome again to the Mawa Museum. We have an exciting program for you tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the museum. Uh, we're in the middle of Mawa, uh, and uh, we have two permanent exhibits. That's Paul and Mawa, and we have the Donald Cooper Model Railroad. We are very appreciative of the support that we've received over the years to the Les Paul, from the Les Paul Foundation, uh, so we could mount this exhibit and run many programs related to Les Paul, like the one tonight. Uh, temporary exhibits, we have Palisades Amusement Park and Women's Right to Vote. Um, and uh, an exhibit on the history of Ramapo College, the first 50 years. Uh, coming up in our lecture series on April the 24th at 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning, Vince Garulio will give a talk on the history of Palisades Amusement Park. This will be the fifth presentation that Vince has made. They've all been uh, sold out. Uh, so I, I recommend that to you. That, maybe a few seats left. We'll probably schedule that again in the fall since it's been such, in such great demand. On May the 3rd, uh, Tom Dunn and Dick Roberts will talk about the unique architecture of Ramapo College uh, and the award-winning design of the buildings that uh, were opened in 1971. And uh, related to Les Paul and the history of Les Paul, uh, ongoing programs in celebrating Les Paul Chris Lenz, who was the uh, Les's photographer over many decades uh, at Fat Tuesdays at the Iridium and many trips that uh, Les took, including to the, to the Cleveland Clinic and to Nashville for various celebrations. He will show some of the pictures from his connections. If you've seen him on Facebook, he has a very extensive and unique collection of pictures, pictures uh, from, uh, taken with Les Paul over the years, and he'll present a selection of those uh, on May 17th. Um, you can go to our website to see other programs that we might add um, over the next weeks. And finally, we're open on Saturday morning, Saturdays from one into four. Um, and uh, so check our website for future programs and, and openings. Tonight, I'm very happy to welcome to a presentation tonight, uh, someone who seems like an old friend. Uh, <laughs> this is the first time I'm meeting her, at least electronically. I followed Sue for many years uh, because of her work in Waukesha, uh, documenting the, the history of Les Paul. We're very excited to have Sue tonight uh, talk to us about uh, Les Paul in Waukesha, and she is uniquely qualified to do that. And uh, uh, before I turn it over to Sue, I'll remind you, uh, we're going to break around in the first part of uh, Sue's program so that uh, we can get to some of your questions. If you put them in the Q&A portion, we'll monitor those and um, pass them on to Sue, and, and then uh, she'll continue with her talk after that. And There'll be ample time for questions and we welcome those. Sue, thank you again for participating in this program. Well, well, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see here. Um, okay, I have to back up a little bit here. Okay, there we go. Um, as most of you know, Les Paul was a musician, an inventor and an entertainer. And a good friend to many of us. Uh, I had the chance to become friends with Les and had many long phone conversations. As most of you know, um, Les is the only person in the National Inventors Hall of Fame and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But tonight we're going to focus on 
the beginning of Les's life, the early years, the part from the time he was born in Waukesha until he left. And you probably will know some of these stories, but I think maybe there's a couple here that um, Les told me one-on-one, -on -one, just little funny trivia things that I'm hoping that you enjoy uh, those stories. So I don't know how many of you know where Waukesha is. We're about 20 miles west of Milwaukee, so where the Gold Star is. And this is what Waukesha looked like when Les was growing up, obviously circa 1924, and the population was over 12,000 people. This is where Les was born. His dad had a garage um, and where he repaired carts and cars and that. And Les was born in the apartment above the, uh, George's garage. And if you look closely at the slide, you can see that it says um, gar George's garage over the, the big opening. This, is, um, this was about, oh, maybe two blocks from Main Street in Waukesha. So very close. Everything that Les did in Waukesha was, was pretty tight um, in a very uh, small area. This is the only photo I have ever seen of Les's parents together, George and Evelyn Stutz Polstice. And there's little Lester, <laughs> so cute. Les talked a lot about uh, both of his parents actually. He talked about his mom being um, very intense. Both of his parents came from German immigrants. That's their um, family heritage. His mom had very strong feelings. Les talked about her being a communist. And I looked up a little bit more and she would read the, the communist paper. She belonged to the communist party. She thought communism was better than democracy. Uh, Les said that, you know, she was always very supportive, but also very strict. And he said, if I didn't do my chores, I was in trouble. <laughs> as far as George, he said, he was a real trip. <laughs> and those were Les's words. George was uh, a gambler. He was a storyteller. And from how Les said it, I got the impression that there were some tall tales involved. He also was a bit of a womanizer, which caused issues with, with uh, between Evelyn and George. Well, in one of George's gambling games, he won the Schlitz Hotel, which is in downtown Waukesha. And actually this building still exists. Um, right now, the first floor is a, a restaurant. So when you come to Waukesha, you can eat in the hotel that George Polfis owned. And when, when Les told me about, oh yeah, my dad won a hotel in a, a game of craps and then he lost it. And I thought, well, I, I need to know if this is, you know, if this is really accurate. And sure enough, George Polfis is listed in the city directory for Waukesha for 1918 and 1919. So he won it and he lost it. But he also won a taxi company, he won a trombone. And Les said, my dad would come home with the strangest things and then he would lose them the next night and get something else. So there are some interesting things going on there. Um, Les talked about how his mom always called him Lester. She never called him Les or anything else. It was always Lester. But she was the one who gave him the name Red because of his red hair. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. George was the one who gave him the name Red. Evelyn was the name who gave him the name Red Hot Red for his first stage name. George also called him Nibs. And Les said to me when he was telling me this, he said, I don't know why my dad called me Nibs, but sometimes he'd call me Nibs. And then he would also call him, uh, however you say, redhead in German he would call him that as well. Now, this Ralph and Lester, um, Ralph is Les's older brother. He seven, was seven years older than Les. 
one of the things that's interesting when you look at the photo of the two boys is to know that Evelyn sewed all of their clothes, um, even the, the suits that they wore. The photo on the bottom with the, when Les has got the, the blue hat on, that looks very much to me like he was at his grandparents' farm, which was about four miles from where um, the Poultice home was. And Les talk, talked about going there every Sunday. And he said, we always ate fruits and vegetables and brown bread. And that was important because one of the things that Evelyn always said was, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. <laughs> she had strong feelings about what people ate. She also said one or two beers a day was very good. So <laughs> she had um, very definite feelings on, on those sorts of, of things. And that the round picture with Les holding the cat, um, that was in the collection of the Waukesha County Historical Society and Museum. Evelyn had given the museum quite a few uh, photos and other papers that had been Les's. Um, and, and I just always thought that was an adorable photo of Les. This is Evelyn and Les. They're at a park in Waukesha. And no, I can't tell you exactly which park, but um, I, I always like this picture because I think it epitomizes how Evelyn was always supportive of Les. Um, she was always telling him um, that he should go out and, and keep doing what he was doing, no matter what it was. Les's parents got divorced when he was eight years old. And from the conversations I had with Les, even when he was in his 90s, that, that certainly had a very big impact on him. When Les was a preschooler, he told me that his mom would dress him up and she would contact the Rotary and the Kiwanis and the Lions and, and any other club that was having meetings in Waukesha. And she would say, I have this really talented son and he sings and he dances and he tells little stories. And wouldn't you like him to come and entertain your group? And Les said that this was before he was even in, in first grade. He said that he was so small that the guys would pick him up and set him on the table. And then I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I would sing and I would tell little stories and I would dance <laughs> on top of the table um, and entertain. So Evelyn was pushing her son out there from the time before he was even going to school. This is where Les grew up. Um, the Polspis family lived in that apartment above the garage for about two years. And then this house, which was actually, oh, maybe a block or two from where the garage was, uh, George built this about two, when Les was about two years old and they moved here. And, and this was the house where, where Les grew up. And yeah, that's, that's little Lester standing by the, the front porch. Now, most of you probably know that the living room was incredible incredibly important to Les. He often said that I, everything I needed was in the living room. He sometimes called it his laboratory. And one of the most important things was the player piano, of course. Now, before they had the player piano, they had a, a different type of piano. And Les talked about that when his mom was and dad were going through the divorce, he said, I would hear my mom sit at the piano and she would play old German songs, old sad German songs. And he said, and she would just cry. And he said, I didn't understand it at the time, but she was singing the blues. And he said, that, that really affected me. Now, the other important thing about the, um, the piano, the upright piano, was that, of course, it had, it was a player piano, so it had the rolls. Well, when that piano first came in the house, Evelyn said to Les, Lester, you know I let you take everything apart. Do not, under any circumstance, take apart my piano. You know how important it is to me. Well, in the beginning, Les was pretty good. He would, he played with the rolls on the piano. He would punch holes in the rolls and he would tape up the, 
the rolls. And he said, when I ran out of tape, I used Band-Aids. <laughs> so you can imagine what this roll must have looked like. Um, and if you're curious, like I was, I did ask Les, so what was what song was on the roll that you punched holes in and taped? And he said it was Barney Google with the goo goo googly eyes, um, which I have actually seen. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so Les was experimenting with sound. And by punching holes in and then taping them up, he was actually doing his first experiments with sound on sound. Because when that role was played, it sounded like two pianos were playing. So he did that. And then when he told me about his mother's strict orders of do not take that piano apart, I said, oh, less. You didn't. He said, I couldn't help myself. It, it was there. I had to find out how it worked. And I said, oh, but you, you couldn't have. And he said, I waited till my mom went grocery shopping. And I took a sheet, like a bed sheet. I spread it on the living room floor. And I put everything in order so that I could put the piano back together again. And I said, well, OK. Then what happened? And he said, she came home early. And I said, oh no, what, did, what, what happened? And he said, she didn't say a word. She just stood in the doorway and tears rolled down her cheeks. And I said, oh, bless, how did you feel? And he said, I felt <coughs> awful. I felt so guilty. And <coughs> the mother, I said to him, you should have felt guilty. <laughs> but he did put the piano back together. And um, when Evelyn called in a piano repair person to check to make sure that Les had put it back together, Les said, the piano guy told Evelyn, it's better than new, it's great. So that was what Les did. Oh, and if, do you notice the um, saxophone in the background? That was for Ralph to learn to play. But Les said he never played well at all. <laughs> he wasn't interested. This is another view of the same living room. And if you notice on the left where there's, there's a stairway and then there's slats of wood going up the steps. One time when Les was talking to me, he said, you know, every night when I would go to bed, I'd play the wooden xylophone. And I said, Wooden xylophone? I don't know that I've ever heard of a wooden xylophone. He said, well, there were these slats next to the stairs. And when I would go up the stairs, I would pound out songs. I would go up and down the steps. And, and uh, because the, the slats were different lengths, I could do that. And I said, oh, that's kind of neat. He said, yeah, but there was a problem. What was the problem, Les? Well, one of the slaps was out of tune. And I said, oh, no, 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 you didn't. You tell me you didn't. He said, well, I did. I had to. I said, OK, tell me, what did you do? He said, I shaved off the bottom of one of them. And of course, I'm thinking in my mom role, I know what I would have said to my kids. I said, what did your mom say? And he said, oh, she thought I was brilliant. <laughs> I said, you know what, Les? You had the right mom. So this, this is an overview. Um, and if this photo looks a little weird, it's because it was taken during a flood. And that's why you're seeing all the reflections. So the St. Paul Avenue, um, where Les's house was on, was flooded. But in the red um, oval, that's where Les's house is, was. And then by the red arrow, you can see there's train tracks. So you can get an idea of how close Les's house was to the train tracks. Well, when he was little, he said he observed that when the trains went by, the windows would rattle. And he wondered, why are they rattling? And he also observed that when he put his hand on the window as it was rattling, that he could make it stop. So he wondered about that. And then he wondered also about why does the train sound different when it's coming towards us and then it sounds different when it's leaving. So he asked his mom and his mom said, well, I don't know, Lester, but let's go over to the junior high 
and talk to the science teacher and see if he can help us figure out what the answers were. I said the science teacher and, and many of his teachers were very, very good and helped him indeed find the answer to his questions. Um, the science teacher took Les across the street to the library and this is what the library would have looked like um, when Les was growing up. In fact, this photo was taken in 1915. The library is still there and this part of this part of the building is still there, but the library, as you may well imagine, is a lot larger now. Oops, wrong way. Well, besides the player piano being in the living room, there was also a gramophone, or as Les called it, a talking machine. And um, he said these were so important. And I was just reading something today from notes I took when I talked to Les. And he said that they had the gramophone before they had the player piano. But he said um, he was curious because when he would run the roll on, on the player piano, if he slowed it down, the pitch didn't slow. But when he played the gramophone and it was the record was spinning around, he put his finger on the record, the sound went lower. And he was trying to figure out why that happened. And there too, they went back to the science teacher to, to get those questions answered. Ah, here's one of my stories that I've, one of Les's stories that I haven't seen written up anywhere. Now this is not Les Paul, and this is not his dog, but this is as close a photo as I could get. Les told me how he had a wagon and he had a little dog and he, figured out how to hook the dog up to the wagon to give him a ride. And I said, well, how did that work? And he said, well, my dog really didn't want to move forward. I said, okay, so what did you do? He said, well, I got a long stick and I'm envisioning something like a bamboo fishing pole, you know, something like that. And he said, I, I got a long string and I tied the string to the end of the long pole. And then I tied a hot dog at the end of the string. I held it out in front of the dog. And I said, how did that work? He said, oh, it was great. The dog ran like crazy. I had a great ride. But a cat came by. And he said, then the dog went crazy. And when the cat ran up the tree, the dog tried to chase him up the tree. And he said, the next thing I knew, I'm flat on my back. I'm looking at the sky. And he said, I looked back at my house and my mother is standing in the front door and she is laughing, doubled over. She's laughing so hard that the tears are running down her face. I said, were you hurt? And he said, no, just my pride and my wagon was wrecked. <laughs> I thought you'd like to see the schools where Les went. The, where it's on the left on the top where it says park school, that's what the El Les's elementary school and the photo, the black and white photo right next to it is Les's first grade photo. Do you see where the little boy with the turtleneck is? And the, it says Lester, that's Evelyn's handwriting. This was a photo that, that Evelyn had and she gave it to the Waukesha County Museum and, and they shared it with me. Uh, I just got a kick out of this photo when I saw it because I had, by the time I had seen this photo, I had known Les for quite a while and I knew how he loved wearing turtlenecks and it just cracked me up that if you look closely, Les is the only one with a turtleneck. It's like he got it, wore it in first grade and never stopped wearing turtlenecks. <laughs> oh, and speaking of Les and turtlenecks, there he is on the bottom left, standing in front of the, the junior high school. Um, that was Waukesha Junior High School. And to the right, what the yellow brick building is Waukesha High School. Well, they were, um, these two schools were in the, in the same block geographically. They were just sort of at one end of the block and the other at the other end of the block. And over the years, they were used for different purposes. In 1993, the two schools were merged and there was a cause, uh, yeah, kind of a bridgeway put between the two buildings and they were just used 
for a middle school and they were called Central Middle School for quite a while. And then in 2014, the school got renamed to Les Paul Middle School, Central Campus. And I think Les would have really liked that. I was very pleased that it got renamed. So Les, I asked Les about when he was in school and you see, there he is, Lester Folsbis. Oh, and if you know how Les's name was, last name was spelled many different ways. Um, by this time, Evelyn had already taken the middle S out of their name. So that's why it's spelled the way you see it in front of you. Les told me that he loved sports. He said, I really enjoyed them. He said, the problem was I wasn't very good at them. Well, a couple of years ago, I got my hands on this uh, yearbook from the high school. And when it said football league C, I thought, mm, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess Les enjoyed football, but didn't make the A team, so to speak. He also said he liked swimming a lot. And in Waukesha, there's a river, the Fox River runs right through the middle of downtown. And Les told me how in winter he would often um, ice skate on there as well. Ah, the harmonica. So Les said he was about 10 years old when there were ditch diggers in front of his house. And probably most of you know this story, but one of the ditch diggers, every time lunchtime came around, would pull a harmonica out of his lunch pail and would be playing the harmonica. And Les said, it sounded like the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. And he said, so I went over and I stood at the edge of the ditch dig of where they were digging. And he said, I just stared. He said, I was too shy to say anything, but I just stared at the guy. And finally the guy pulls the harmonica out and hands it to Les and says, here, you want this more than I do. And Les said, just as he was reaching to accept the harmonica, he said, I don't know where my mother had been, but her hand reached out in front of mine, grabbed the harmonica and said, you're not playing that until I boil it. After that, Les said, then I boiled my guitars to give them that nice bluesy sound. About the same time, Les was also a paper boy. And it looks like the picture of me is on top of the paper boy. Sorry about that. Um, that is not a photo of Les as a paper boy. I don't have any photos of Les as a paper boy, but you get the idea. And what you're not seeing on that black and white of the paper boy is that he has a, a, a bag, like a sack, whatever, on the side of it. And Les said he and his friend would sit in this park and this, where you see Les on the left, that is actually the park. It's called Cutler Park in Waukesha. And it's oh, about two blocks from where he grew up. And he said he would sit on um, in the park on an Indian mound actually uh, with his friend, Harry Tice. And he said that the two guys would, what they call supplement, they take ad sheets and they'd stick it inside of each of the newspapers. And then they'd roll them up and they'd put them in their bag so they could deliver them later. And he said, Harry was always a lot faster than I was at supplementing the papers. He said, so I'm sitting there and I'm supplementing my papers and I look over and I, and he said, there's Harry and he's wrapping wire around a toilet piece of a, a toilet paper uh, core and Harry's counting one, two, three. And Les said, what are you doing, Harry? And Harry said, I'm building a crystal radio set. And Les said, what's that? Well, of course, Harry told him about this newfangled thing called a a crystal radio set. Well, anyone who knows Les knows that the next day, Lester had a crystal radio set. <laughs> and he said, uh, so he built his own crystal radio set and his bed had exposed springs like you see in that lower picture. And sorry, that's the best photo I could find of exposed strings, uh, springs. But Les said he took the antenna from the uh, crystal radio set and attached it to the springs of his bed so that he would have, in effect, a really large antenna, which of course gave him um, a broader reception as to the radio stations he could get. 
And I thought this was very telling when Les said radio was the internet of the 1930s. That makes a lot of sense. And he talked about being able to get programs from Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Memphis, Nashville. And he said he would stay up till two o'clock in the morning. Now this is, remember, this is a kid who's in middle school, early high school, and he's staying up and he said, I didn't care, I didn't need to sleep. I just was so enamored with the radio. I wanted to hear it all. Well, he had that little crystal, whoops, little crystal radio set and he was listening to the, the big radio in, in their home. And no, this isn't from their home. It's just one similar to it. Well, there was a radio transmission tower about, oh, maybe five miles, six miles from their house. And Les would ride his bike in, over to this community. He was actually taking piano lessons. And he noticed the tower. He said he had his little crystal radio set and he put it in the basket in front of his bicycle. And he would drive over and, and go right underneath the tower. He said, I wanted to hear everything that my radio could possibly pick up. So he would sit there. And then one of the days he was there, he went and he knocked on the door of the office that was there. And the guy opened it up and said, um, well, come on in out of the rain because it was raining that day. And so Les went in and he showed his little uh, crystal radio set to the engineer there. And the engineer said, so you didn't really knock on the door to come out of the rain, did you? And Les said, well, not totally, I really am interested in radio, I wanna know everything. Well, Bill, the engineer said, I'll tell you what, Les, you come here every Sunday and I'll tell you all about radio. And that's where Les first started learning about radio. So we talked about building a one tube radio transmitter and lengthen the antenna up to the roof so he could hear all over the block. But typical of less, that wasn't good enough. Now, if you look at the red square, and I know it's a little hard to see, Les's house is there, and you can get a little bit of, a, of an idea. There was a, there's a big hill behind where Les's house was. And he talked about after he had the, the antenna up to the roof, then he took another 100 feet of wire and ran it through the uh, up over the hill and through there was woods there and through the woods so that he could transmit more and he said he would transmit all over the um, the neighborhood and and had a lot of fun with that ah Les's first guitar and most of you know that it was a 1927 flat top troubadour and 395 in the Sears catalog and that was how Les started with, um, with the guitar. And many of you may know that the story of when Les was opening up the box, that as he went to pull the guitar out, one of the strings got caught on the box. Bing! And from the kitchen, Evelyn says, Lester, you sound wonderful already. <laughs> That's a good example of uh, Evelyn's support for her son. Well, one of Les's, Les listened to a lot of different uh, performers, but one of his favorites was Pie Plant Pete. And Pie Plant Pete was in the WLS showboat. WLS is a radio station in Chicago and it, it still exists. But uh, the WLS showboat, um, show would, would travel around and it came to Waukesha. When it came to Waukesha, um, Evelyn found enough money to buy tickets for herself and for Les. And so they went to see this. Well, Evelyn wanted to make really sure that Pie Plant Pete saw her son. Pie Plant Pete was dressed in a sailor suit because it was showboat. So Evelyn sewed a sailor suit for Lester so that he would show up. And that's how Les 
uh, was known for wearing the sailor suit. Now in this picture, of course, we also see the harmonica rack. And many of you may know that Les's older brother, Ralph, worked in a dry cleaning store for a long time, actually. He drove a truck and Les said, oh, we had wire coat hangers all over the house. Well, Les knew how to play the harmonica and he knew how to play the guitar and he wanted to play both. Well, there were um, harmonica holders available in the 1920s, but when you put your harmonica in the holder, it clamped and it stayed there and you couldn't turn it. You had to decide which side you were gonna play um, with your harmonica. Well, that wasn't good enough for our Lester. So that's why he devised the harmonica holder so that he could flip it with his chain, chin and play both sides and not have to stop playing the guitar. So the, this photo of Les with the sailor suit is his first professional um, photograph. It was used, Les would have been 13 years old. He had his first professional gig at um, a hotel in downtown Milwaukee. And this photo was taken to promote that, um, his performance. He said that this was the first time that when he performed a price was arranged ahead of time. And he said, so after that happened, I considered myself professional. This, I love this photo. This is the 19, Waukesha 1929 Fourth of July parade. And if you look in the background, you can see that they're parked actually in, in front of Les's house. Les, of course, has the guitar. He's in the middle and he's got the, the harmonica rack. And these are all his buddies that he cajoled into um, playing in the band. And they actually won first place in the 1929 July 4th parade. So Les played at a, a barbecue joint called Beekman's Barbecue. And up on the right, you can see a little photo that was obviously taken much later than when Les was playing there. I, I think it was the photo of Beekman's is probably from maybe the 1940s and Les would have been there in the 1920s. Um, the illustration on the left is from Discovery World and it's showing you how Les, when Les first went out there, he just had his guitar and his harmonica, just playing acoustically. And then People weren't able to hear him, so he took his mother's telephone, he put it on a, a broomstick and used that as a, a microphone PA system, however, and he hooked it up to his mom's radio, which you, you can see in that illustration. Well, that was fine, except that the car, uh, the car hop brought a note to Les that someone in the back had written and said, we can hear your jokes, we hear your harmonica, but we can't hear your guitar. Well, that's all you need to say to Les to inspire him to do something else. So he then took the arm, uh, sorry, he took the needle from his father's phonograph and jabbed it into the bridge of his acoustic guitar and attached that to his father's radio. So we had two radios one for the microphone to catch his voice and his harmonica, and the other was capturing, uh, electrifying his guitar. So already in what would have been about 1929, Les had electrified his guitar. Les's electric guitar, 1929. So Les talked about how he didn't like how the box of the guitar was vibrating. And it was an acoustic guitar, somewhat similar to what you see in front of you. He said, I wanted to hear just the strings vibrate, nothing else. He said, so first I took socks and I took a tablecloth and I even took some underwear and I stuffed it in my guitar and I played my guitar. And I said, how did that sound? He said, horrible. <laughs> and he said, so then I put plaster of Paris in it. And that's what you're seeing in front of you. And I said, so how did that work? He said, yeah, I needed to get another guitar. So he thought about it. 
and he thought, okay, what I need is the most dense material that I could possibly find. Now, remember the photo of his house and the railroad tracks were really close by. So the next step that Les did was to take a two foot piece of, of rail from the train track. Now he didn't cut it from the, the functioning track. In the 1920s, when the people from the railroad would come and check the rails to make sure they were in good condition. And when they found something defective, they would cut that piece out and they would just throw it over the edge. So it, there were scrap pieces of, of rail and that's what this is from. So hmm, let me back up a bit. How did Les get this rail? So he told me, he said, well, first we borrowed a wagon. And I said, you borrowed a wagon, Les? And he said, well, we returned it. So isn't that borrowing? Okay, Les, so then what? He said, well, I borrowed the wagon. I got six of my buddies. We went down the embankment. Now, if you don't know Waukesha, the, the railroad tracks were right along the Fox River and the embankment was is really steep. It's, oh, it's more than 45 degrees. It, it's, it's steeper than that. And of course it's by the river. It's almost the time it's kind of muddy. Any rate, so he said, I had my buddies drag the wagon down the embankment and along the river under, there was a bridge there under the bridge, there was a two foot piece of rail. And he said, my, I had my buddies lift up the rail, put it in the wagon and then take the wagon up this embankment and across the street to my house. I said, Les, wait a minute. You told me this is your project. And then you told me that you borrowed the wagon and your buddies took the wagon down the embankment and your buddies picked up the rail and put it in the wagon and your buddies took it up the embankment and to your house. He said, yeah. I said, but it's your project. What were you doing? He said, well, somebody had to manage it. <laughs> so he had the rail, took it in the house, and they had obviously picked up some spikes from the railroad as well. So he took a string from a guitar and stretched it across, um, across the spikes. And he took the microphone from his mother's telephone. And obviously his mother had a candlestick phone and that's why this picture is here. Put it under there and then he plucked the string. And he said, it was phenomenal. He said there was so much sustain. He said, you could go out and get a sandwich and come back and it would still be playing. He said he was so excited and he called his mom. Mom, mom, come, you gotta see this. I, I've just got a solid body electric guitar. Did I mention that he connected this to his mom's radio? So indeed, it's a bit of a stretch, but this was a solid body electric guitar. So in my mind, I can almost see Evelyn coming in from the kitchen, maybe with a towel wiping her hands. Okay, Lester, what have you done? And she takes one look at this thing and says, you gotta be kidding me. The day you see a cowboy riding a horse with a piece of rail? I don't think so, Lester. And she walked out of the room. I said, Les, how did you feel? He said, oh, I was disappointed. But I knew she was right. But he was only in high school, maybe 15, 16 years old. And he was already thinking about a solid body electric guitar and working on it. Kind of amazing, really. I found this photo. WTMJ in Milwaukee is one of the places where one of the radio stations where Les performed. He performed at WRJN in Racine, and Racine, Wisconsin is um, south of Milwaukee, about halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago, roughly, roughly. So Les would go in, and this is what radio stations would look like. You know, one microphone there and, and a maybe a piano or an organ. And so Les would stand in front of that and, and sing his songs and play his guitar and, and his harmonica. There was another radio station in Milwaukee and actually it's still there um, called WHAD. And it was connected with Marquette University. And Les said, I would go to Marquette and I would play a song 
on the radio station in exchange for getting my teeth cleaned. <laughs> Creative guy. Les's dad owned one of the first auto dealerships in Waukesha, and this was on Main Street. This would have been about two blocks from Les's house. Like I said, everything was close by. And it was called the Poultice Hins Motor Company, and they primarily sold Dodges. But this was an incredibly important location because most of you know about Les um, creating a lathe, a recording lathe. Well, it started here. Les had gone over here to talk to his dad and said, Dad, I'm on the radio and people tell me I sound good, but I can't hear how I sound because I'm playing and I'm hearing it differently than the people who are listening to me. And I need to hear how I sound and I need to build something that records. And, he, and uh, George said, talk to Hooks. Hooks was uh, the mechanic that worked at the auto dealership. So Hooks took Les under his wing, so to speak, and said, well, the first thing you need is something round and, and solid. Ah, let's go behind the, in the alley, behind the, the uh, dealership. There's an old Cadillac there. Let's get the flywheel from that Cadillac and we can start with that. Well, sure enough, this is um, a replica that Les built of, of his first lathe and it had the Cadillac flywheel and at different times Les talked about a, using a paring knife or a nail to actually record his um, sounds and he did it. He said it was very barbaric but he said it worked. <laughs> so um, again he's He's still in high school. I mean, he, think about it. He left Waukesha when he was 17 years old. So he built this when he was 15 or 16 years old. Who, what 15 or 16 year old builds something like this, especially back then? Well, probably you've heard about Sonny Joe Wolverton. That's who you see on the left. Les had met Sonny Joe um, when Sonny Joe was in a town that's, oh, close to Waukesha, let's put it that way. Sonny Joe was performing and Les was totally enamored with, with Sonny Joe's techniques and, and how to, he was playing the guitar. And he really wanted to um, be with uh, Sonny Joe and listen to him, learn from him. Well, I'm kind of short, shortening the story, long story short, that eventually, uh, Sonny Joe called Les and said, Les, I've got a job for us in St. Louis. Why don't you come to St. Louis and perform with me? Les was in his last year of high school, he was 17. And he said to me, he said, well, first he said to Sonny Joe, I gotta talk to my mom about this. Les said, I was helping my mom make a bet. He said, it's so vivid in my memory. He said, she's on one side of the bed, I'm in the other, and we're tucking the sheets in. And he said, I said to my mom, Sonny Joe Wolverton has invited me to go to St. Louis and join him on radio live. And I said, how did your mom respond? And he said, well, she was real quiet because she always wanted me to finish high school. That was really important to her. But he said, she knew I was talented. And so she took a deep breath and said, Lester, it's your life. What do you want to do? And Les said, I don't need to know any more math. I don't need to know history. I know I want to be a musician. I want to do this. So she said, okay, I will get tickets and you and I will take the Greyhound down to St. Louis. So Les was so excited, so very excited. He knew he was launching his career. So Les talks about how his mom, and I can't, I can't really picture this, that his mom made a casserole for them to eat on the bus going down to St. Louis. So they did that. Um, when they got to St. Louis, 
Sonny Joe was there waiting for them. Evelyn got off the bus with Les, looked at Sonny Joe, who was 10 years older than Les, and said, take care of my boy. And she turned around, got back on the bus, never left the bus station, and went back to Waukesha. That had to be hard. That had to be really hard for her. Les talked about being really excited, but being terribly homesick when he was in St. Louis. Well, here's a few photos from when they were in St. Louis. Um, Sonny Joe on the pictures on the bottom is playing the violin. And the picture on the left on the bottom, Les has a guitar and he has his jug. He talked, Les talked about when he was going to St. Louis, he took his harmonica, his guitar and a jug with him. So he was playing the jug. And on the top right, you see Sonny Joe and Les and Ken Wright. Um, Ken is playing the accordion. And on the bottom right is when Les and Sonny Joe were in Chicago. And they performed together there on a couple of different radio stations. They also played at the World's Fair that was happening in Chicago at the same time. Now, if you can't get enough Les Paul, and I hope you can't, make sure if you don't have it already to get Les Paul in his own words, and you can get that through the Les Paul Foundation website. If you have kids that you wanna inspire, there are two really great books. The Guitar Genius on the right, on the top is a very fun book. And if you want, um, easy book for any age. It, it's, it's a fun book and it's easy and it's a very good overview of what Les Paul did. And on the bottom right is a book that was written based on Les Paul in his own words. And it was written for, oh, I think it's about sixth grade level. Um, and they're both very good books. There's other books out there, but in my way of thinking, these are the best. And of course, please go to the Les Paul Foundation website. There's lots of information. Did you know you can print out free posters if you go to lespaulfoundation.org and go to the education area and then you can see lots of free posters that you can just print for yourself. So that's the part of the formal presentation. And are there any questions? Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. You really um, added to our knowledge about less. And we do have a few questions. Uh, um, I, I, the, the, the first one I, I saw was, uh, how did the two brothers get along? Was, was the older brother jealous of less? Less talked about that they, they got along. I mean, there was a pretty good age difference. There's seven years difference. One of the funny things was that um, Les, because Les was always taking everything apart, he said, I'd be taking things apart and Ralph would yell out, Ma, the kid's at it again. And Evelyn would say, leave him alone. He needs to learn. Um, but Les talks about, he referred to Ralph as being handsome and uh, getting along. And as Les got older, um, probably a lot of the people who are listening know about how Ralph and George, Les's brother and father, owned a place called the Club 400. And Ralph asked Les to come back for the opening and perform, which he did. So they, they did get along. What, was that in uh, 1949, he came with Mary? It, yes, yes. And, and that's when they got married and um... Steve Miller's father was involved in that? Well, you, you, you're kind of, you've got a couple of things pushed together there. Um, Les and Mary were married at the Milwaukee County Courthouse, December 31st, 1949. And Steve Miller's parents were the maid of honor and the best man. And, and, and Steve 
grew up knowing less and uh, admiring less and so forth? Yes. Um, when Les and Mary would come to Wisconsin, let, uh, Steve's dad had a tape recorder. He was a bit of a, a techno geek, if you will, of the day. And he would record Les's performances. And then Les and Mary would go to, to Steve's house so that they could listen to the performance and decide what they wanted to change. Well, Steve was a little boy at that time. And Steve talks about when he was five years old, Les gave him his first guitar lesson. So, and you know, anyone who's, who's seen Steve over the years, Steve always talks about Les. So yes, there was always a very close relationship there. Somebody wants to know about, uh, is Les's house, the original house, is it still there? Unfortunately not, no. Uh, the places that are still available to see in Waukesha um, are the the two the schools that I showed you are still there. Um, there's also a place called the Les Paul Performance Center, which is a uh, a band shell, which has been in operation since 1920, constantly. It's, it's never sat dormant, and. It, the name got changed in 1988 um, to the Les Paul Performance Center. So that's still there. And the Club 400 is still there. And, and that's a really fun place. Uh, when people come to Waukesha and, and I give them a tour of the Les Paul sites, we always, we always stop at the Club 400 and then you can sit at the bar and, and have a beer and <laughs> celebrate less at the Club 400. The other thing that, that is there is in Waukesha is the memorial where Les is buried, um, which, which is always a, a fun place. Well, that's kind of weird to say. It, it's it's um, a very nice place to visit. Um, there's a little bit of a, a short biography of Les literally inscribed, and there's places to sit. Because when Les um, talked about his memorial, he said, I want to be buried next to my mom. I want it in a park-like setting and I want benches for people to be able to sit. So we, we did all of that. Um, and, and it's fun because people leave guitar picks and lots of pennies, lots of pennies. It's nice, it's very nice. Another question is, uh, was Les self-taught as a guitar player and did he read music? Les said he never learned to read music. He took formal piano lessons. He learned most of, he, he was self-taught as a kid with a lot of, as far as guitar playing, he would listen to Pie Plant Pete and, and other guitarists of the time. And, and he would listen and then try to replicate it. And when he would go and see um, different guitarists perform, he would copy their licks. Um, and there's a funny story about, um, Gene Autry was in Waukesha and Les and one of his buddies got in to see Gene Autry perform and, and Les was really intrigued about one of the um, fingerings that, that Gene did. And every time that Gene Autry did a, played a certain note, he'd, Gene Autry would see a flashlight go off because Les's friend was holding the flashlight so Les could try to write down <laughs> What the, what the fingering was. And at one point, Gene Autry finally stopped and said, okay, what's going on? Every time I play this note, I see a light go on in the audience. <laughs> so Les was learning that way, but he learned the most uh, um, guitar training from Sonny Joe Wolverton. Did I answer uh, that question? <laughs> somebody, I don't know if, if, if you wanna, uh, if you're able to tell us about LA his time in LA was a question about uh, Los Angeles. I've heard that the only studio Rex writing a uh, WC Fields were uh, were doing at the at the, a studio in the garage in LA. Are these recordings available? Recordings that Les made of WC Fields in in LA. Uh, oh, Les performed or Les recorded a, a number of of hits, oh gee, I'm trying to think. Um, he recorded Lover, which was, you know, his introduction of Sound on Sound. 
Um, that was done in the garage and so was Brazil and several others. And, and those songs are readily available. Right, you know, right. CDs and stuff. The, the garage um, in LA was an amazing, um, if you will, set of inventions by Les. Other people tried to replicate the sound that he was able to produce in the garage and, and no one was able to do it unless even helped a couple of um, people try to do it, but <laughs> they weren't able to replicate it. Uh, somebody else says, was, was Les a good student in all of his other classes other than music? <laughs> Um, I never got a definitive answer on that. Actually, uh, that question came from Steve Lucas, a good friend of the museum. But Steve knows that uh, <laughs> that that Les's music teacher told his mother that he was not going to make it in music. So don't, don't send it back for lessons. I think yes. that I heard that story. I don't know. <laughs> yes, that was um, piano lessons that Evelyn paid for Les to take, and and that. Yeah, that, that teacher put pin the note. The, the story is that Les always played by ear. So if the teacher would, the piano teacher would play something and he'd say, okay, Lester, and she had the music in front of, of him. Now play this. Well, Les wasn't reading the music. He just picked it up by ear and he played it right away. And, and he always did fine. But one time she realized he wasn't reading the music. And that's when she pinned the note to his shirt, which they used to do back then. And he said, I skipped all the way home. I thought it was great because I knew I was a good piano player. And he got home and his mom unpinned it. And I remember I said, when Les told me the story, I said, Les, didn't you unpin it and peek at the note? And he said, oh, no, no, I didn't do that, which honestly amazed me given <laughs> Les's <laughs> character. But um, so when Evelyn unpinned the note, and read it, she just started tearing it up. And Les said, well, what did she say, Ma? Ma? And Evelyn said, she said you'd never be good at music and I should save my money by not sending you. But don't listen to her because you're going to be great, Lester. That's good. That's good. So another question. Did the foundation donate the films of Les Paul and Murray Ford at home, the shows to the National Archive along with his original recording and disc, are these, there any restrictions to access for private use? We're, we're, the foundation is still in a process of organizing all of Les's stuff. Les had that house full of uh, reels of, of film and and music recordings, and we are trying to organize it. We've been, the foundation's been working with the Library of Congress. Eventually things will be available, but not right now, because things are still being organized. Um, let's see, somebody wants to know what became of Les's research on hearing aids. Um, honestly, I don't know what, how that ended. I certainly remember at one point uh, within the, within Les's last year, telling him I that I really needed him to get going because a lot of us were getting older and we probably at some point would need a hearing aid and we wanted to have good ones. And then of course he went and left us and I, I I don't know. <laughs> so much of that. What I can attest to when the foundation allowed us to go into the house after he died to look around and see what we might put on exhibit at the Maui Museum, there was a big uh, milk crate full of boxes, uh, uh, full of books in this milk crate of hearing aids and hearing aid technology. And, and his friends in Maui said he was, he was tinkering around and trying to come up with with a better hearing aid. And uh, I guess he was frustrated with that. Yes, yes. I also came across uh, a recent article, which I haven't gotten a chance to read yet. It's from Audiology, where he did an interview uh, with that journal or magazine uh, where he talked about hearing aids and um, um, his own hearing issues. Mm -hmm. 
and it was done uh, a few years before he passed. Yeah, he obviously was very interested in that, very frustrated by the hearing loss and the tinnitus. And that's why the Les Paul Foundation uh, gives annual funding to the Hearing Health Foundation to research, uh, to give funding to researchers who are looking at trying to solve the problem of ringing in the ears. Uh, even though Les moved away from hillbilly and country music professionally, did he still have a place in his heart and enjoy those types of music that hooked him as a boy as he got older? I, yeah, I think so. In some of the um, videos I have seen of the Iridium, every once in a while, he'll play one of those fun uh, hillbilly songs that he recorded way, way back when. So I, I do think there was a, a warm spot in his heart. And he often would talk about being rhubarb red and red hot red and then all those funny little songs he used to sing. Yeah. I think we've gotten most of the questions now. And, and I, there are a lot of comments, Sue, that uh, a lot of people said they really enjoyed the presentation and they were excited about so much that they learned. And uh, I'd like to uh, echo that because uh, I think uh, I would say the same thing. Ken, yes. Can I just, uh, there, were, there are a couple of extra questions here. Uh, one is, do we know about, do we know what year Les got the Cadillac flywheel from Georgia's shop? <laughs> he would, my, this is a guess, but I'm guessing he was about 16. So, um, you know, doing some quick math, what is that? 19, uh, 15, 30, 31, 31, 31. about. Okay. A, uh, another quick question. Do you know the year that, uh, Les's parents got divorced? Uh, 1920, uh, let's see. Um, about like 1923. Okay. And I think, uh, I got a follow-up question. I think clarification on uh, the uh, the recording studio in California, where um, I guess W. C. Fields recorded there. Mm -hmm. Are there any recordings that exist of uh, W. C. Fields in recording with Les? I don't know that. I don't. I don't know. I, I, I honestly, that's not the area that I really work in. In the foundation, others are doing that work. We, 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 we got an um, inquiry from somebody in Southern California that has some old recordings and we're trying to follow up to see what they are and whether he would like to donate them to the Maui Museum. That's just, a, we don't know much about them. Good. I think we covered all the questions, Charlie. Great. This has been a lot of fun, Sue. And I had a lot of fun. I think uh, you have a wealth of knowledge and uh, maybe in the fall we, we can have you back again if, if that's possible. We could probably do that. Great, that's great. Do a little different approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, like you said, there are a lot of stories. There are, and it's um, any time, you know, you talk about less <coughs> often, oh, I forgot about that. You know, <laughs> there's always something a little bit more. And um, he was such a fascinating guy, just just amazing. Um, and, and and second to to playing his guitar, I think uh, telling stories was his favorite thing to do. <laughs> he was quite the storyteller. And, and any of us who who got to be friends with Les know that once you got on the phone, you better be ready to sit for two hours because <laughs> he was going to spin the stories. Um, and I don't know, I, I just felt very, really privileged to be in that mode and I always felt like a sponge. I just wanted to absorb everything that, that he had to say. And we had, Les and I had great conversations because I've lived in Waukesha a long time. And so he would say to me, well, do you know where you know, something was, and I'd say, oh, yeah, well, right now, you know, it used to be called that, but now it's called this, and yeah, the building's still there, and now, last the building's gone, so um, it was fun, because he really made 
his childhood come alive for me because I knew where the places were. And I'm hoping that maybe everyone who was listening tonight got a felt like they were taken back in a time machine and had a little better idea of Les's surround, surroundings when he was growing up. I think the, the comments, the comments really affirmed that, Sue. It, it really, it really came through in a, a very uh, detailed and personal way. We really appreciate it. Good. Thanks for inviting me, guys. So we're going to close here. And before we shut down, I, I want to remind uh, everyone in attendance that we are a voluntary museum. We get support from the Les Powell Foundation, and we are assisted by the town of Mawa in terms of our, our building and so forth. But we do need donations and we appreciate those. This program was free tonight and uh, we're always looking for new volunteers. And so you can uh, come and learn more about Les Paul at the Mawa Museum, help us out with our exhibits and our archive and docents and learn the stories and you can tell them to our visitors. Uh, we look forward to opening up on regular basis, hopefully in the fall, but we are opening on open on Saturdays now. So stop by, check our website, and um, thank you for joining us, joining us tonight. And thank you again, Sue. And uh, we'll say good night. Good night, everybody. Night.